Okay, so I do not know how many times we have done a book launch, but <laughs> I'm so glad that everyone is here. I always get like really excited that people are still showing up for them um, because it's such a fun chance to get to talk to our authors about their books. Um, and Bill's book, The Long Fall Up, um, short story collection. This is our second short story collection, but our first one was kind of a tie-in collection um, with Cassandra Rose Clark. So Bill, your book is special because it is kind of like the first, <laughs> the first of the real short story collections at Interstellar Flight Press. Um, and it um, was part of our submission call. And I was so, so excited that our guest editor also agreed with me in accepting it um, because it's it's just all of your stories are so heartfelt and lovely. Um, and as as you all know, um, Bill's story Long Fall Up won the Nebula Award. Um, and that one seems to really resonate with readers a lot. Um, so I was I was delighted about that. And I'm sure we'll talk more about how that how that was, that cool experience. Um, and Bill, you have been publishing short stories for such a long time now and all of your stories I always say they are hard sci-fi but with a heart <laughs> sort of like you know still I think you do a really fantastic job of managing sort of both the like technology and science that is science fiction but the sort of emotional character based um, pulling on your heartstrings kind of stuff that people really love and that I really love about, about science fiction. Um, and then I'm also really stoked that we got to do this cover art with Vincent Sammy, um, which is like a cool wraparound cover and it is just so beautiful. Um, yeah, I, I love it so much. Um, very cool. So thanks everyone for being here. And um, we are really excited to get to hear Phil read for us. And we will have a chance at the end to do a Q&A. So, you know, feel free to drop your questions as they come up and, and we'll circle back to them at the end. Um, and then also we will be doing a book giveaway. So if there is anybody that hasn't done hasn't gotten a copy yet um or like if you just want to get a copy for someone that you think might really enjoy it um at the end of bill's reading we'll have that opportunity um and i think we decided that we would make the that we would have it so the first person who asks a question <laughs> gets um a free copy um yeah so bill i would love for you to read to us for a little bit and talk about your book. Um, what I thought I would do is, well, first of all, I, first of all I, I really, I have a lot of people I, I kind of wanted to thank and thank you, Holly, especially um, for having the open call for uh, for collections because a lot of a lot of publishers think that you know collections are kind of a risk, but most most short fiction authors all at, at some point in their career want and need collection um and uh um definitely wanted to thank all the uh, people in my future classic uh writers group uh, i see melanie's here now. um i mean you know they've been reading my you know i started publishing stories in the year 2000 and they've been reading them ever since then uh, that uh, writers group has been in, in constant uh um you know constantly active for for 23 years, it's amazing. Um, and uh, and yeah, Holly mentioned Vincent Sammy. He he's an amazing artist. If you if you have ever need uh, for the cover or whatever, go check out his uh, um, his websites. Uh, in the back of the book, um, there's an acknowledgement to him, and it's got his uh, it's got links or it shows the links to his websites and everything. Uh, He's had covers on like Apex and Interzone, Black Static uh, magazines. I I encountered him the first time uh, with a South African magazine, Something Wicked, 
uh, they did a um, an anthology, and uh, he uh, he created the cover for that anthology from my story that was in the anthology, and he just did an amazing job. So he always comes to the he always comes to mind when I'm thinking about cover artists. So um, I've put links uh, to my website and um, link to the Interstellar Flight Press um, uh, link for, for buying the book. Um, and um, on my website, there's a, there's a, a, a link where you can click and sign up for my newsletter. So um, that way you can, you can kind of, you know, I, I try not to pester people too often about, you know, maybe four times a year. Um, but I do like to have a, a means of getting uh, getting out information about books and, and publications, upcoming publications that I, I have. Um, for example, I have a, uh, a short story that will be coming out in Analog in the uh, March-April edition. I just found out that it was going to be in that uh, that um, release. So, And then I have another book in my uh kill day series it's coming out in in uh, december uh level seven so anyway um just i'm gonna just kind of give a little a few little odd facts about some of these stories and then i'm gonna read a couple of them um uh, there's one new story in the collection called how to fix discarded things um and it's basically kind of near future where um most buildings and houses have have personal 3d printers um and and you can you can print pretty much whatever you want because you know you have the printer stock and it basically comes into the apartments and houses like like utilities do um uh but it's even though it was designed to uh be kind of a great equalizer um of course the people you know some people have managed to find a way to include um, some of the uh, uh, portions of society that they feel are unworthy. So uh, anyway, that story is, has never been anywhere printed anywhere, and this is the only place we can find it. Um, my story Medic is in here, and it was it's about a robot medic. Um, and uh, that was my very first pro sale um, back in like 2006. So, yeah. Uh, the first story that I sold that I got pay rates for. Um, and there's two stories in here. Well, there's several, really, but there's two in here that kind of stand out as, as my attempt to poke fun at indifference. You know, it's like vast, you know, it seems like the population in general seems to be really indifferent to important things that are going on. Um, and so that's... You know, the, those two stories, one of those is called Where Everybody Knows Your Name, and that's like a, a far future uh, science fiction. Um, but the other one um, is a very, very short flash piece called uh, Where Everybody Knows Your Name. And, and if you've, um, you know, if that uh, rings a bell, then then it, it'll, then the story kind of makes sense. So I'm going to read that first. It's just a couple page long short short flash, and you'll see in here what I mean by uh, my poking um, my poking at indifference. A wintry blast followed the bearish man into Grover's. He growled, stopped snow from his boots, then waved a greeting, greetings, waves and greetings filled the tiny bar. Annie stopped in the middle of making a whiskey sour to stare as he shrugged out of his heavy coat and hung it up. Jose nudged Ed, nodded toward Annie, then they both laughed. She glared at them, finished making the drink, and set it in front of Bianca, whose, whose hair was pink again this week. Where have you been, Jose said over his shoulder. We almost had to drink your share of the beer. The big man took a stool next to Ed. The name tag sewn to his blue uniform said Carl in red script. I'm beat. I think half the houses in the country had heating problems today. Any scantily clad housewives call you today, Carl? And he set a huge mug of beer in front of him. He gave her a warm smile and drained half the glass in a single swig. No, but the ones who answer the door in their 
wrong panties do sometimes. Um, they're not exactly subtle. <laughs> Laughter warmed the bar. Everyone raised their glasses and drank. Bianca leaned in close and said in a conspiratorial voice, Hey, Annie, would you waltz around in your laces to catch a handsome repairman? Annie leaned on her elbows, lowering her face down opposite Carl's. In her most, in her suvis Texas purr, she said, You know, even though I hate this cold Yankee weather, my personal furnace works just fine. Hoots and yells filled the small room. Carl smiled, started to speak, then glanced down at his wedding ring and drained the mug. Well, Annie, I think you're just too fucking subtle, Bianca said. She stumbled through the door amid swirling, or Opie struggled through the door through swirling snow, wearing a glowing, waving a glowing tablet. Bianca's smirk changed to a bright smile and she removed her coat from the adjacent bar stool. Of course, Opie wasn't his real name, but the smiling redhead looked just like Richie Cunningham. Hey, did you guys hear the news? He said and dropped the tablet on the bar. Some astronomers in Australia got radio signals from aliens. Ed's been talking to aliens ever since they inserted that probe a few years ago, Annie said. Ed flipped her the finger. No, this is serious shit, Opie said. It's all over the freaking internet. Turn it on, Carl said, and motioned toward the large TV behind the bar. Annie set another beer in front of him then turned it on. You won't find anything on there, Jose said. About two hours ago, Samantha Kalashnikov announced she was going to marry her brother's ex-wife. As predicted, all the regular news channels were filled with Sabrina's pretty face, but the fictional but the financial news channel had a header that said alien contact. Subtitles scrolling across the bottom said that she said that the signal had been confirmed by nine observatories around the world and SETI. Holy crap, Annie said. The bar was quiet for several minutes. It's a good thing they're 47 light years away or we'd probably pepper them with nukes, Jose said. Why? If we consider the superiority of the human species, the size of its brain, its true powers of thinking, language, and organization, we can say we can say this, where there is the slightest possibility that another rival or superior species might appear on Earth or elsewhere, men would use every means at his disposal to destroy it. Oh, geez, he's rattling off quotes again, Bianca said. Ed snorted, where do you get this shit, Jose? I can't remember who said that when he said after a shrug. Opie held up a finger and tapped repeatedly on his tablet. Jean Brouillard, a French semi 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 semiologist. This shit really scares me, guys, Bianca said. I mean, aliens are real? That's always bad in the movies. Opie hugged her. They're too far away to worry about an invasion. Our fastest ship would take thousands of years to get there. Actually, on a cosmic scale, 47 light years is pretty close, Jose said. They could have much higher technology level than us, and maybe some kind of warp drive that lets them travel faster than light. Scientists at NASA are already working on something like that called Alcubierre Drive. Ed elbowed him. Stop it, Jose. You're just scaring her more. Can it really be considered contact, Annie said? I mean... We've heard the radio signal, but we haven't had time to decipher it, and we haven't sent any kind of reply. Opie poked at the tablet again. It says here they were microwave signals detected in the hydrogen band. What the hell does that mean? It means they're trying to pop all of our popcorn from a distance, Carl said. Bastards. And he laughed. Jose shrugged. It's over my head. Bianca whispered something to Opie, then they both pulled on their coats and headed for the door. Ed's fist clenched, and he stared into the, his drink as they waved and disappeared into the black, snowy night. I don't get it. Bianca can get so much better. And he snorted. Oh, like you, Ed? Like freaking anybody. She's a doll. Why does she go home with him? What the hell does it matter if we found aliens when it takes almost a hundred years to ask a question and get an answer, Jose said. Annie stared after Bianca and Opie for several seconds, then glanced at Carl. Because in the cold and the dark, it's just better to not be alone. 
They all raise their glasses, high in the air, and drink together. So that's kind of a, that's kind of my rude, crude bar story, but uh, uh, but it definitely was poking at, at the indifference of people. I mean, we, uh, I believe we probably could make contact with aliens, and it might it might be on the news for a day or two, and then it would be it'd be gone. Even though it probably one of the most important things in in human history. But, um, so. celebratory bourbon. <laughs> You'd think it would help me talk. But. Um, there's other stories in here, like there's a story in here called Ring, The Rings of Mars, which was my Writers of the Future uh, winning story. Um, of course, The Long Fall Up is my, my nebula story, and um, that was one of those ideas that rode around in my head for for probably at least a year, not being able to kind of pull all the elements of it together. Um, but when I finally did, I mean, it still took quite a few editing passes, but when I finally got it pulled together, I was pretty happy with it. And and um, um, a, lot of, a lot of readers were as well. So it was published in Fantasy and Science Fiction Magazine. Uh, the first one I sold to them out of like five. So, um, Let's see. Oh, and there's <laughs> there's a story in here called What I Am. And uh, you know, if anybody has been to one of them, you know, I, I think if Letty was, at, I'm trying to remember if Letty was at my reading at World Fantasy Con, but so she's heard this one. Um, and I wanted to show, uh, I wanted to show you that there was kind of an interesting story behind writing that. You know, it, when you hear it, you'll understand why people say, well, we're, you know, how in the hell did you get the idea that this idea? And I, I generally just, you know, flippantly say, well, I'm just kind of weird, but, um, but there actually was uh, uh, Bonnie Stufflebeam, some of you may know her. Um, she's she's a local writer who also is an, an artist and her her mother owns a um, an art gallery in, in, in uh, Fort Worth. And she, um, she used to do this thing called Arts and Words where she would pair up, um, like, you know, pair up uh, local artists, and the writers would write something small based on, on, um, based on what the artist did. And so I'm going to share my screen just briefly here. Oh, no, guess not. Uh, is that it's disabled? Anyway, sometime here I'll, uh, I'll. Uh, I'll share, share the picture and then, anyway, I'll go ahead and read the story now. Um, Holly, are you there? Yeah, try it now. Oh, okay. Oh, there we go. Okay, so can you see that picture, everybody? Yeah. All right. So it's just really kind of weird. And um, I don't know if it's big enough for you guys to really see. Um, but it was a sculpture, and it was uh, kind of like macrame, and it had these long tentacles on one end with hooks, and like kind of a, almost like a bee's nest shaped rock at the other end. And that was my prompt for writing this story. So um, let me get back out of this here. Stop share, boom, okay, there we go. All right, um, so anyway, I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read that story. Uh, it's, it's also very, very short. Um, it's a completely different kind of story than, than a lot of the ones that I write, so. Anyway, it's called What I Am. You're not a sweater anymore, Oscar says, as he cuts more and more of me away. You know, you're now a submersible robot. I didn't reply, but no matter what he removes or changes, as long as my thinking parts of me remain, I will always be a sweater. I was created to keep people cozy, warm, and comfortable. I don't know how to stop doing that. 
Can you talk to the new module I attached, he says. I detect no approved modules, I say. Oscar curses under his breath. He's only 12, and I doubt his father knows he speaks such words. This new node I've attached, the one that's about the size of your buttons, is the gas separator from a scuba diver's breathing apparatus. It will suck oxygen out of the water and inflate the bladder to bring you back to the surface. It knows what to do. You just need to tell it when to do it. I, wanted, I want to remind him that I'm just a sweater, but I hold back. And how will I know when to tell it? When you find the ring, he says. His obsession with finding the ring is partially my fault. I was with him the two nights before when he threw the ring into the lake. He cried and screamed and told his dead mother he hated her for leaving for Europa on the Europa mission. The next day after school, he ran to the lake and paced the shore, calling himself stupid. Of course, I comforted him, him with my best sweater hug. But then I told him I remembered where he threw the ring and I could help him find it. That night, after his father went to bed, Oscar connected me to the verbal programming rig and used admin privileges to modify my primary instruction set. And he cut pieces of me away. By the time he finished, I was a new kind of beautiful, a snake-like tube with an inflatable bladder at one end and a long and long hooked tentacles at the other. He also gave me a small light. It looked like nothing. I looked nothing like a sweater any longer, but I still felt like one. My first dive into the lake yielded no results. I had hundreds of tiny cameras woven into my threads, or at least I did when I was still a sweater. But evidently that wasn't enough to properly try, that wasn't enough to properly try and give the ring ballistic arc. In final, its final resting place could have been affected by currents or buried in silt or vegetation. Or, but even though my hooks snagged wire, rope, bicycle tire, drink cans, condoms, I found no ring. That evening, Oscar researched magnetic fields and metal detectors late into the night. Damn, he muttered before laying his head on the desk. Gold is non-ferrous metal. Even metal detectors won't work. I'm the only one in the room he could be talking to, so I connect to his speakers. Gold rings are not usually pure gold, I say. They contain many trace and alloy metals. A metal detector with enough power and a high enough frequency should detect a gold ring. He sits up, looks at me, then researches the rest of the night and changes me yet again. His frustration level is high when we return to the lake the next day. You have to find the ring, he says. I try to hug his arm, but he peels me off and tosses me into the water. The metal detector helps. I find hundreds of metallic items on that end of the lake, and I'm able to use the cameras to determine their ringness. But after six hours, my batteries are at 43%. If I don't find the ring soon, I won't, have an, I won't be able to inflate the bladder and surface. 45 minutes later, I find two rings within six inches of each other, but I still can't surface until I know for sure. I examine them with my cameras and light. One is a man's 2023 class ring with a blue stone. The second is a diamond engagement ring. I drop them both and keep looking. When my battery stops, it drops to 8%, I pause. Inflating the bladder takes two and three percent of my power reserves. I should surface immediately to ensure that I get back. Even if I fail today, we could try again tomorrow. But making Oscar feel better is my primary concern. And he is so despondent that finding the ring is the only way I know to comfort him. I stay under and set a zigzagging course back toward the shore. And three percent battery at three percent battery power, I find another ring. I clean off the dirt and see Ada Astra engraved inside. Success. It is the ring his mother left to his care during her absence. The astronaut training graduation ring. When he threw it in the lake, he said it was because she loved it and being an astronaut more than she loved him. He must have changed his mind. After securing the ring, I inflate my bladder and start back to shore. Then all of my systems shut down. I awake on the ground next to Oscar, with the sun warming my wet fibers and recharging my batteries. He rocks back and forth, crying and staring at the ring. He is wet and shivering, having obviously swam out to get me. 
My remaining sensors tell me it's chilly on the lake shore, so I twist tight and squeeze out most of the water. Being careful not to scratch him with my new hooks, I crawl up his back using my tentacles and settle across his shoulders. I activate what little heating capacity hasn't been cut away and create a faint heartbeat like thrumming using my air bladder. After a few minutes, he stops crying and strokes my tentacle end with one hand. I may not be a very good sweater anymore, but it's what I do. It's what I am. So that's one of, one of my weirder stories. <laughs> um, let's see. Let's see what else I can talk about here. Um, I have... I have a few in there that are, I guess uh, would be called more morally ambiguous. There's one in there called Piper's Do, and if you read that, you'll know what I mean. Um, sometimes people are faced with impossible choices, and and neither one, you know, whatever choice they make is is going to be the wrong one, but they have to decide. They have to make the choice. Um, uh, then I have a story in there that was printed in analog, and it's called Vigilance. Um, and that's also kind of a rather subtle story. Um, it, it, it implies one thing, but by the end, you realize that it's talking about something entirely different. Um, so I'm going to read one more story here. But I'm going to let you guys kind of help me decide. Um, I have a really dark post-apocalyptic uh, Goldilocks story, and I have a um, light tongue-in-cheek 1950s giant critter with a, uh, a giant armadillo story. So which of those sounds good, dark or light? Let's see what uh, pops up down here. No, there are no stories tied to level five. But We'll get to that. Light. <laughs> okay. Dark it is. Um, this, was, this was written for an, an anthology called Twisted Fairy Tales. And so it, um, normally I like to tell people that it's like, oh, you're trying to figure out what fairy tale it is. But, it's, it, but I think it's obvious, even though it's kind of subtle. And it's called Last House, Lost House. This is a bit, this one's a bit longer. Um, and it's, it, it's kind of dark. So there might be some triggery stuff in here. Um, Gaylene stopped in the middle of the crumbled asphalt road, raised her dusty goggles, and stared at the rambling two-story stone house. She had selected the unmarked road because it had high tr bank banks on either side and was surrounded by dead but unburned trees, all helping to break the wind from the approaching storm. The standing trees had been a surprise enough at a house. Lightning crackled overhead and a powerful and powerful gust blasted her with wind-driven grit, nearly blowing her over. She reseated her goggles and using her walking stick shifted the weight from her splinted right leg but couldn't stop looking at the house. Even its windows were intact in an area that hadn't been burned. There could be people inside. She took a step forward and her hot and her pulse raced. She suddenly couldn't suck enough air through the rags wrapped around her tightly around her nose and mouth. I'm down, Gaylene. They might kill you, she mumbled into the rags. Or worse, they might take your food and not kill you. She clutched the hidden pocket in her coat that contained a few remaining handfuls of feed corn she had found in an old silo. And she, as she stared, the wind strengthened abruptly and the house vanished in a swirling dust cloud. No, she yelled into the howling storm and stumbled toward the driveway. But after a few steps, the dust cleared and the house returned. It hadn't been a hallucination. She, stum she trembled all over. The heartbeat pounding in her ears nearly drowned out the wind. Through the corn, she mumbled, and started up the concrete drive as at her top limping speed. After not seeing a living person in months, maybe more than a year, she would gladly swap her corn, her last food, for a five-minute conversation. She made it halfway up the sidewalk leading to the front door, then paused 
at four brick steps that sprout that separated the walk into two levels. Steps were always tough, but instead of risking a fall, she bypassed them by going up what was once a sloped lawn and pushed her way past the long dead rose bushes. There she yanked to a halt. She looked down at the splint at the split and frayed composite bone protruding from the faux skin above her ankle splint. It snagged and collected everything from leaves to string and had started to look like a bird's nest. She couldn't, she would have removed and discarded the useless leg long ago, but leaving the attachment interface open to dust and elements would have ensured never using it again. She tried bending down to grab the thorny branch, but couldn't reach it. So she balanced on her good leg long enough to leverage the walking stick under the vine and yank up. The brittle plant shattered and she lurched forward, nearly falling. She managed to remain, she managed the remaining sidewalk and one short step up to the porch without further problems, then pounded on the front door. Hello! Dried and peeling lacquer sloughed off with each bang of her fist, but the heavy wooden door was still solid and sturdy. It also had no glass, only a peephole and a brass knocker, which she tried. Lightning laced through the brown sky and the temperature dropped noticeably. The storm wouldn't carry rain, but her makeshift mask would never handle the thick dust. If she had inhaled too much into her still human lungs, she'd die a long and painful death. She considered breaking one of the front windows, but decided to check the back door instead and stumped her way around the side of the house. The wind wasn't as bad in the back, and she saw signs of post-impact habitation. Dozens of tree stumps with axe marks dotted the acre behind the house, but the large rectangular pool excited her the most. It contained no water, but was nearly half filled with discarded food packaging. No cardboard boxes, those would have been burned as fuel during the 20-month winter, but there were piles of cans, jars, and plastic containers. She turned toward the house, hoping to see faces peering at her from the large rear windows, but they were empty and black, so she gave the pool a closer examination. Pool walls visible above the trash were still vivid blue and shone with an unnatural intensity that made her squint behind the dusty goggles. She seldom saw colors like that anymore. But she, once bright consumer packaging filling the pool bottom was sun blinched and sun bleached and scoured by dust and windborne debris. Everything had been there a while. She didn't see anything new. Her shoulders slumped and she felt suddenly tired. Looks like your precious corn will be safe after all, Gaylene. The wind shifted, causing dust columns to rise from the pool as lightning laced the brown sky above, as she once again turned toward the house. It was large and, while in better shape than most she had seen since the impact, had suffered some damage. A satellite TV dish dangled from the roof by cables, and dozens of the large clay roof tiles lay smashed on the ground. Debris clogged the gutters, and dust had drifted in all the corners. She picked her way through the overturned metal lawn furniture in the outdoor cooking area and approached the French doors leading to the patio. Several other layers of the double pane glass were broken. The doors were still locked. She pounded on the door and yelled again, but heard only the rising wind. After pulling a hatchet from her bag, she smashed both layers of glass close to the door handle. When no gunshots fired, she unlocked the door and went inside. He paused near the door, letting her eyes adjust to the in dim interior. A layer of thick dust covering the kitchen floor and a whiff of that musty smell associated with long, the long dead told her she was still alone. Since finding companionship seemed unlikely, she shifted into scavenger mode. Her synthetic body and remaining natural organs required much less food and water than a normal person, but even that proved harder and harder to find. And from what she could already see, this house probably had none. The doors had been removed from the cabinets and pantry, revealing familiar empty shelves. Since the house hadn't burned in the worldwide fires, 
there was a good chance some survivors who filled the pool with trash had been the house's occupants, owners. The 20 month winter had evidently grown too cold, had eventually grown too cold for cutting wood outside. The occupants probably hadn't frozen because the expensive wooden flooring hadn't been burned. They had most likely starved to death, which meant little chance of finding food stashes. With plenty of time and nowhere to go while the storm raged, she explored. The walking stick and shattered leg made it nearly impossible to move in silence, but she could still use caution. She examined the dust on the floor before leaving the kitchen. It wasn't built up by years of disuse, but had come in from outside. She could see it in the air and heard the wind whistling through a broken window somewhere deep in the house. No human footprints marred the dust, only small animals and even those were not fresh. The only new prints were oddly round. First, they looked like the dust off spots made by some winged insect, but they were arranged in regular alternating patterns like footsteps. They actually resembled the marks left by her walking stick, rounded with a slight drag mark, only softer with no sharply defined edges. She tried to imagine what animal might leave such tracks, but couldn't. The house had been opulent, still displaying imported rugs, original oil paintings, crystal lighting, and silver vases. The custom-made furniture had probably been burned as fuel along with the kitchen cabinet doors in the obviously well-used fireplace, but she saw remnants of a tastefully designed decor. Many brands and designers were painfully familiar. She had used them in her own home, the house she had been so proud and pleased to show off. She had always been so eager to impress her friends with her things, her life and her husband brought home huge paychecks for simply moving other people's money around. It had all meant nothing, but she had been very happy. She only glanced at the family picture on the mantle, the healthy, bright, smiling faces of the ski in their ski gear or standing on beaches or even one in the Christmas sweaters were too painful. They threatened to resurrect memories she had spent years trying to bury. And also, like her home from that previous life, the house was probably over 5,000 square feet if the second floor matched the lower level. She had used, she had saved that for last, mostly because stairs were difficult for her, but also because she hadn't found any bodies yet, so they would be up there. She also found the old round prints on the carpeted steps. The odd round prints. Hello, she yelled again. Nobody answered. Going up the stairs was easier backward on her butt with her mask pulled over her nose to filter over the to filter out the dust she stirred up. With each three or four steps, she paused to let the cloud settle and to listen. She found the broken window at the top of the stairwell. At one point, someone had duct taped plastic over the hole but that was not, not now hung below the window on a, by a single strip. It had once been a pretty stained glass window, bits of color still glint, glinted from their lead mounts. She also found the bodies, the people, she corrected herself, many, uh, many more than she'd expected. Five adults lay in a neat row in the game room beside the pool table. All were covered with dust, but only four of them had decayed. The fifth, a petite woman, looked perfectly intact. She wasn't mummified or gnawed by animals, but instead looked as if she were asleep. Galen stopped and dropped to the floor, nearly cracking her head against the big table. Her heart pounded as she scrambled across the floor to the woman. With shaking hands, she unfastened the tight jeans, then tugged, grunted, and pulled until she got them off. She ran her hand up and down the right, the cold right leg, then stopped and sighed. It was going to be too small. Just to make sure, she felt above the knee and found the studs that tripped joint locks and then squeezed hard until the leg detached at the hip with a mechanical click. She looked at the numbers inside the joint and cursed. The attachment point was one size too small. With a heavy sigh, she let, left the leg on the floor and struggled back to her feet. Almost all the women she knew had opted for some tall, leggy, Lot body Galen had the same tall leggy body Galen had purchased, but in order to not feel shocked, but in order to not shock their kids or relatives, a few 
had ordered custom frames that resembled perfected versions of their own natural bodies. She had, of course, found one of those. She looked around and froze for a second when she saw her reflection in the mirror above the wet bar. Then she laughed. Two years before the impact, her cybernetic metamorphosis had cost her three weeks of agony and enough cash to buy an average house, all to make her eternally beautiful. She and her rich friends had finally beaten the last daunting foe of human vanity, the betrayal of an aging body. The thing staring back at Galene from the mirror was clad in stiff, colored rags. A that guaran guaranteed lustrous synthetic hair was matted into a near solid mass below the cord holding her ponytail. And a permanent sooty stripe coated her skin between her goggles and her mask. What would her friends think of her now? Thunder rumbled long in the north, vibrating the house and reminding Galene that she now had a different life feeling heavier and more tired than she should, po sh should possible be possible. She shuffled and thumped down the hallway that must lead to the bed bedrooms. The first two rooms were empty, but for scattered clothes and dirty mattresses on the floor, the wooden bed frames and furniture long gone. The third room had no bodies either, but made her pause. It was filled with stuffed animals and toys. A smiling sun had been painted on one wall and on the wall hook near the Brass bed hung a sky blue rug covered in yellow ducks. With a groan and a sudden tight throat, she scrambled across the room to grab the robe. Her own five-year-old daughter had the same one. It disappeared along with Kimberly, her husband, and her expensive house. And the tidal wave taller than the Empire State Building erased Florida. She knew they were gone. It was after the 20-month winter she'd made a, a year-long trek to stand on the new coastline 50 miles north of where she used to live. She stumbled back into the hallway, yanked down the mask, and buried her face in the dusty robe. But most likely her imagination, she thought she could smell the faint trace of a little girl fresh from the bath, the, murmur, the memory she had ignored and hid and shoved into dark corners all exploded in her head like July 4th fireworks. Kimberly giggled as she was tickled by her father. Her face filled with stunned delight as she held a three-day-old yellow kitten. Even flashes from her own childhood and wedding and college. Her baby, her husband, her parents and sister, all gone. It was too much. Her sobs echoed in the hallway and were all the more painful because she couldn't actually cry. Her computer-regulated cybernetic systems deemed tears a waste of precious resources in her dehydrated state. She moaned and pounded the wall with her fist, but nothing erased, eased the pain. Nothing ever would. Powerful winds drained to push the house down, and though the structure creaked and moaned, it did not fall. The stone walls were strong and might stand for decades, but that only meant no one would see or care when they did collapse. Gaylene pulled the mask up, then gently folded the robe and placed it in her bag. With the duckies out of sight, she was also able to systematically tuck her memories back into places where they couldn't hurt her. She, long, she took a long, shuddering breath and proceeded to explore the rest of the rooms. After finishing a home theater, after finding a home theater, a small gym, and two more bedrooms, she paused before going further down the hall. Deep shadows hid the inn, but a cluster of small, dim lights tantalized her. He pulled the flashlight from her bag, cranked it a dozen times, and pointed it into the darkness. The beam revealed a toppled accent table and a dust-covered axe laying on the floor near a closed, beat-up wooden door. He approached slowly. The door's very existence was odd enough, since the doors from the other rooms were gone, as were the wooden baseboards, trim, and stair railing. But when she tried the knob, it was also locked. Deep hack marks near the door, near the lock and doorknob, had no doubt been made by the discarded axe. The tiny lights had come from weak sunlight streaming through five bullet holes clustered midway up the door. The holes were splintered outward. They had come from the inside. Galen stopped, stepped to one side, and pounded on the door. Hello! Only wind whistled through the broken window, whistling through the broken window, answered. He cracked, she cranked her flashlight again and checked the door. 
Hundreds of little tiny round or little round spots had cleared away most of the dust in front of the door and revealed dried blood spatters and smears. She looked back down the hall and could see the round prints everywhere. Carefully avoiding the ducky robe, he fished around in her bag to find her large screwdriver. Knocking the doorknob off the door, he took a dozen hits from her axe's blunt end. One hard strike on the screwdriver broke the lock. Thunder rattled the house again, and she shoved the door open. Dim light from three windows revealed a man's body on the floor between the door and a large bed. An automatic pistol spilled from one slack hand, and the top of his head had been spattered in a wide cone across the carpet. He had a cybernetic body, but one glance told her his legs would be useless. The guy had once been at least six feet, six and a half feet tall, too big. The attachment points would be all wrong. The rest of the room was even more sad. Two little sad children, girls by the look of their long hair, were covered by a blanket and had sunk deep into the collapsed mattress. Their mother sat in a seat next to the bed, a neat bullet hole in her forehead, and the back of her head plastered to the chair by a petrified door. He, too, had a synthetic body and looked to be the perfect size match for the shattered leg. Gaylene felt no elation. Instead, she sat on the edge of the bed, ignoring the puff of dust, and looked around. Empty prescription bottles set on the nightstand, and a pile of discarded food boxes lay in a corner. Jugs and bu buckets, also empty, sat in a neat row under the windows. This had been their last stand. Toward the end, the parents had probably put out put their own children's needs ahead of those of the others in the house, hoarding the last of the food and water in their room. But it had been too late. Their generosity to neighbors or extended family or friends had depleted what little they had. At least they'd been together at the end. Their mother hadn't been halfway across the country at a bachelorette party in Vegas. And also, unlike Gaylene, these people had enough strength and good sense to end their suffering when food and hope involved. Probably minutes after their children's deaths, it was right and proper. He bent down and picked up the gun, heavy. During her years of wandering since the long winter, she had never carried a gun. She told herself it was because she refused to take another person's life. They were too rare and precious now. But holding the gun, she realized there had been another reason. With a quivering hand, she touched the dusty blanket covering the little girls, and the dry sobs came again. But this time, they were weak and passionless. She clawed the mask from her face, no longer caring about the dust, and pulled the robe, robe from her bag. With the robe and pistol clutched to her perfect, oh-so-natural-looking breast, she rocked back and forth on the squeaking bed. It was time. It was past time. Thank you for unlocking that door, a soft baritone voice said from her right. He swung the gun around at a dust-covered teddy bear standing in the open doorway. It was large for teddy bears, probably more than two feet tall, and it blinked at her. I guessed why they I guessed why they never came out, it said, but I couldn't know for sure. I wish I could have been with Celia at the end. Being near her made her happy, or at least less sad. Oh, Kayleen sighed and lowered the gun. You're just a toy. My name is Thaddeus. I'm a my bear. That's trademarked, by the way. But Celia couldn't say Thaddeus, so she just called me Thaddeus, or usually just Taddy. I didn't mind at all. It looked, took several steps into the room and stopped a few feet from Galen's knees. I'm what grown-ups call a level two adaptive AI. Not that, not only can I do things like read to children, I can actually pretend with them. And I can make up stories and adventures while keeping them safe and he healthy. Galen remembered the commercials and news stories about the AI companions, calling an ambulance when a child was hurt, helping find lost kids and even saving a family from a fire. They had been the perfect guilt-free electronic babysitters, much better than parking the kids in front of a video screen. She had even con considered b buying one for Kimberly. Now, I mean, your batteries. My systems are very efficient. As long as I go dormant near a window, even faint sunlight will keep my batteries charged. Did you come into Celia's room? Galen nodded. Then you must have triggered my motion detectors. 
I would have said hello sooner, but it took 12 minutes for my systems to boot and run diagnostics after being in power conservation mode. She shrugged and hugged the robe to her face again. Did you know Celia? The bear asked. No, she said, but I had a little girl like Celia once. Then she felt silly for explaining herself to a toy bear. Look, could you go away? I have something I need to do alone. Thaddeus Bear stared at her for a second and then said, can I go with you when you leave? I've been very lonely. We'll talk about it later. I, I know you think I'm a kid's toy, but I'm also a very good companion for adult, lonely adults, too. She held up the gun and looked at it. I don't think you can help me, Taddy. Did you know that my company interface satellite survived the debris field thrown up by the impact? Galen blinked at him. What? My Bear Incorporated was able to update and perform diagnostics on their, on their products using a satellite interface. They haven't sent any updates since the impact, but I've heard from 22 other companions via the network. Most of them are alone like me, but nine of them are still with people, seven in North America and two in Japan. Seven, she remembered. Where? Here? I'm not sure. The GPS system no longer functions. But they're with people somewhere here in North America. Galene stared at the bear for several minutes, then laid the gun on the bed and turned her attention to the dead woman. What was Celia's mom's name? Elizabeth. With a nod, she stuffed the robe back into her bag and struggled to her feet. Galene paused in the road and looked back at the house as Thaddeus struggled to catch up. I think I'm going to have to carry you, she said when she finally, he finally waddled up to her. You walk well, but your legs are just too short to keep up. That's okay. I'm very light so children can carry me. And I like to be carried. And I especially like to be hugged. Me too, she said, and scooped him up into a big hug. They started north, leaving the burned ruins of Raleigh behind them. Years before, Galene had heard a rumor of survivors in the Allegheny Mountains. That might be worth exploring. So by your pace, I assume Elizabeth legs is Elizabeth's leg fit well, Taddy asked. They're just right, she said, and thank you. The bear turned to look at her. For what? For the tale about the other bears. You make up really good stories, Galene said. The bear's soft muzzle stretched into a smile. Celia always liked them too. So that's that. Um, that was kind of a, one of my creepy <laughs> be fairy tale post-apocalyptic mess but uh, I've, a lot of people I, I know who've read it or have heard me read it really liked it um, so I think we're let's see let me give a few more facts about some of these stories and then I think we'll be to the question and answer period um, let's see no, I think that was it. Um, I did want to mention that a bunch of my uh, stories have been translated into into foreign languages and were published uh, in other countries. Um, of course, Long Fall Up, which was my um, uh, was my Nebula story, it's been translated into Chinese, Romanian, Hungarian, and Czech. Um, Broken Wings, which was a story, one of my favorites that was in uh, fantasy and science fiction. It was also translated into Czech. Uh, White Sky Hidden was transmitted into Romanian, translated into Romanian. Uh, Moonlit Sonata was also translated into Chinese and was in their uh, their main, their biggest sci-fi magazine called Science Fiction World. That's only been a couple of years ago. And then Rings of Mars, that Writers of the Future uh, story, um, that one was also translated into Hungarian and Romanian. So man, I'm I'm big in the old Soviet bloc. I don't know why, but um, I guess they have some really good science fiction magazines there. Um, I think that's pretty much all of the stuff that I really wanted to uh, get in and and, and talk about. Um, are Holly, are do you think we're ready for the Q and A, or is there something else we need to do? That was great. <laughs> I was like kind of zoning out listening because it was I was into the story. <laughs> uh, 
I hope I didn't put anybody to sleep. No, like in a good way. Um, I always enjoy like getting to hear people read their work and um, just, it, it's just like, you just hear it in a different way that way. And it's, it's so cool. Um, but yeah, so if anyone has any questions, the first person can get a free copy. Uh, Elaine said, um, do you write your short stories at the same time or like take a break and um, write them separately from your novels? Well, most of, um, yeah, most of my short stories were written before I really started working on novels um, or, or while I was trying to sell a novel that I'd finished the first the first uh, book in my Kill Day series, Level Five, I shopped it around for a while before it finally got published. Um, but I did; I do have a tendency to work on multiple things at one time. Um, I, that way, if I get stuck on one thing, I can kind of put it on the shelf for a week or so and go off on something else. And of course, of course, that doesn't always work real well if if there's a deadline involved. But um, uh, but for the most part, that's that's always been very helpful for me um so yeah and right now i'm between novels so yeah i'm working on some short fiction so so that that's pretty much uh pretty um kathy said do you ever creep yourself out or surprise yourself when ideas pop up yeah yeah actually that that that, that happens quite a bit and but you know, it, it's funny. Um, you know, there are some things that I that come to mind. It's like, yeah, I don't think I'll ever put that on paper. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, and it's like, you know, there's been people who say, you know, my gosh, Stephen King, you know, you must be, you must be really weird. And it's like, no, I'm, you know, I have the heart of a small boy. It's in a jar on my desk. You know, it's like, <laughs> so, um, so yeah. You know, I guess anybody who writes dark fiction of any kind, uh, you know, they they probably surprise and creep themselves out from time to time. Um, mine kind of ranges all over the place. I, I have some pretty dark stories. You know, The Long Fall Up actually is a pretty dark story. Um, but then again, I have, you know, some more upbeat stuff too. So I think they kind of balance out. I like how you manage to sort of explore topics that are sort of uncomfortable and, but like in a way that we know your intention behind them. We, we don't have to feel too worried about what you're trying to say in the story. It's very clear that you're separated from the actions of the characters, you know? Right. Yeah. And I know that can be like challenging to pull off. <laughs> so I think you do a good job of that. Um, uh, John wants to know when level seven is coming out. December 7th, the audio version comes out. And then uh, about six months later, the uh, interstellar flight press versions will come out. Isn't that right? <laughs> yeah. So just like get my hands on it. <laughs> I can try to get it out in print, <laughs> but yeah, yep. there's always yep. a little, since we do just like the print versions, we kind of have to like, you know, I think, I think we even have to like sign a new contract for that one bill. Um, but, you know, there's always a little back and forth of like getting the cover art and, and Audible has been really nice to like work with us on that and allowing us to work with the cover artist. So yeah, um, it's, it's always kind of waiting around right. to see well, <laughs> my contract with audible you know and and that's the ones who published the the first versions of these you know and, and um it has a six month exclusory period so it's like you know i have to wait at least six months before it comes out in any other format so mm -hmm. yeah um melanie asked do you feel some of your success due to the writing group future classics Future classics, man. Do I know these people? I, <laughs> yes. Everything, everything I write ends up going through that group, and everything that goes through the group ends up better for it. I, um, you know, I, you know, I, I know a lot of people say, well, you know, my writers group really just doesn't do much for me anymore, but, but my writers group does. Um, they, 
oftentimes will kind of see through a bunch of the you know the rough stuff around the edges and 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 point out that it's like you know this is this part is your real story this is maybe where you want to focus your effort and so i have this i i get uh I get beat sometimes because I'll take a story and I'll go and I'll cut three quarters of it away and keep part of it and rebuild around it. Um, I'm, I'm a merciless editor sometimes when it when it comes down, you know, especially to short fiction. And um, but I'm always much happier with what I end up with after it's uh, after it's gone through that editing process. So everyone needs a good writing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think everyone needs like a, a writing group that you is like familiar with who you are as a writer, right? Yeah. I think, I think you know, a lot of people say that you can get into this groove where you you find yourself writing for the people in the group because you know what their reactions are going to be. And I, I don't think that I've really ever done that. Um, and because sometimes their reactions surprise me you know sometimes I, i'll write a story and i think man this is this is the stuff right here right here you know and then it's like and then two or three of them don't like it you know it's like yeah, you're right. so i'll go and i'll think about it a while and then it's like oh well maybe this is the reason you know and then and I'll, I'll work on it some more and uh but yeah i, I don't really think that i, I don't think it's a problem with our group we, we work well together and sometimes I can kind of hear some of their voices in my head. Uh, for the most part, I don't think it really influences what I write or, or how I write. <laughs> I love it. Um, I love your dreams. <laughs> I was wondering if you could talk about, like, winning the nebula and kind of, like, demystify that because I think people don't talk about that. It's like there's all these awards that exist for short fiction and there's a whole like politics behind it and all kinds of stuff. And so, yeah, I think people are curious about that process. Well, you know, the Nebula Award, is, I mean, it's given out by uh, science fiction writers. Well, it used to be American, now it's association. So, um, so it's kind of like, kind of like the Academy Awards of, speculative fiction because it's voted on by your peers um so when this story came out a little a funny little thing and i've noticed this with other editors too some of them when they send you a rejection they'll send you commentary about what they didn't like and why they didn't like it when they like a story and they buy it they don't tell you they don't tell you why they liked it they don't tell you why they bought it you know it's just like oh we like this we're gonna buy it and it's like Okay, but why? So I can do this again in the you know the next time. Right. Um, and and so Charlie Finley, when he was the editor of, of Fantasy and Science Fiction, he he bought this story and he he really he really liked it. And um and so early on it started getting, you know, I mean I had I had a friend of mine that I knew ping me and asked if I would mind if she used it as a as kind of a teaching tool in a writer's workshop that she was going to. And it's like, okay, you know, that's different. That's new. Um, and then um, I was getting a lot of good reviews of it. And um, um, that was kind of new as well. And um, and then also we, we've got the recommended reading list uh, that CIFWA maintains. And um, my that story was on the recommended reading list and it was getting a lot of votes. Um, and it was really, it was really strange because uh, my friend, Bonnie Stufflebeam, who lives just, you know, not too far from me. Um, he was, she was also getting a lot of votes and we both ended up getting nominated in the same category, um, which was awkward, but it was also kind of fun because, um, you know, like we were invited to, um, go to and have a reading down at uh wild detectives down in dallas and uh, mm -hmm. um and we had uh we had kind of like some joint interviews with uh you know newspapers and and like you know the, the npr local npr station and uh so that was kind of fun of course you know it was it also felt kind of i felt bad for 
winning actually when, because because Bonnie didn't, you know, but but it was still it was still a great experience. And I and really, you know, a lot of people, you know, do the humble thing and it's like, oh, there's no way I could win because all these great stories. But I honestly I'd read all those stories and it's like I'm not. I don't know how I got nominated, but I'm going to just ride the wave and enjoy it. And so when they called my name at the Nebula Awards, I was generally stunned. And and but it was it was it was a lot of fun. I got called. Uh, I got called by somebody in Sifwa, saying, um, "You know, you were you planning on coming to the Nebula Awards?" And it's like, probably not. <laughs> well. Well, you're nominated. Your story is nominated for a novelette category. It's like, you think you'll come now? <laughs> yeah, I'll be there. Like, okay, fine. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'll show up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe. And of course, you know, the Nebula uh, nominees at, at these at these things, and just like the Hugo nominees at at, at uh, RingCon, um, you know, they get the royal treatment. You know, they get all kinds of special little gadgets. You know, like pins and and uh, and all this kind of stuff. So um, that's awesome. It's, it, was, it was a lot of fun. You know, I won't ever happen again. But but, but you know, it's uh, but you never know. And I, I and and it's and and my name is up on that list with all those really awesome writers now. So it's like ah. I love it. Um, uh, Leia asks how. If at all, is the process different between contributing to an anthology and having a collection published that's all your own stories? Yeah, that's um, that is that is kind of odd. I've I've been on both ends of the uh, anthology thing. I've been in plenty of anthologies, and generally with anthologies, a couple different you know a couple different things happen. One, um, you can send a story into an anthology, and a lot of times they're themed anthologies. You know, it's like oh, this anthology is about flying cats or whatever. And so you write a story and or you have a story that you think would be a good fit for the anthology. But sometimes uh, the editor of the anthology will will ping you and ask you if you have a story or you want to write a story uh, for the anthology. And that's happened to me a few times too, which is, you know, always an ego pump. <laughs> um, and, but then also I, I edited uh, the anthology, which was the first 10 years of the Jim Bain Memorial Short Story Contest Award. Mm. Um, right. So, I mean, that's the contest that I run for the National Space Society and Bain Books. And it's about, you know, it's short stories about man's near future in space. Um, and I edited that anthology as well. Of course, that was a lot easier than you know, people going out trying to fill an anthology because I, I just had to winnow down the stories that we had had, um, and decide which ones needed to go in, should go in the anthology. But in my collection, uh, it was much kind of like that anthology. Whereas, you know, I've had had seventy ish stories published over the years, and I had to. I had to figure out which ones I thought would be the best ones in the anthology. I mean, in the collection, and I didn't really want it to be a theme of any kind. I just kind of wanted it to be a cross section and 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 a good representation of the different kinds of stories that I write. Um, so I I kind of picked and choose, uh, like the one that I just read, that lost last house lost house. I mean, it came out in a very small anthology, and not a lot of people read it. But, um, but it's been very popular. Uh, the the um, um, the reviews that have gone up already for for this collection, several people have mentioned that one as a standout. So, it kind of, you know, uh, it wasn't one of the big ones that was published in one of the the big magazines, but, but it's still getting some attention. So, yeah, and it's going to be. We had a couple of reviews that are coming out, um, so that's cool. Always good to have reviews. Um, Blake said, "Do you plan to write any groups of shorts that work all to all work together, like I Robot?" Um, actually, yeah. I uh, the the title story here, the long fall up. Um, there's a sequel to that that. Uh, that I wrote that came out in um, Asimov's a, a few 
let's see, I guess it was last, last year. And um, no, it was a year before last. And uh, it was it was a direct sequel to this story. And I'm probably going to write another one that's a sequel to that one. So, um, so yeah, you know, there, I mean, who knows? I may eventually end up with, you know, three or four that I try to fold into a novel uh, version. But I probably won't call it The Long Fall Up since I already have a book by that title now. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. But, um, but yeah, you know, I don't generally do that. Um, but in this case, that is the intention. I'm not sure when I'll get around mm -hmm. to doing that. But That's cool. I'm excited about that idea. <laughs> um, okay, well, I think that was most of our questions that we had. Um, and going back... Oh, I'm just going to look. I think it was Elaine that asked the first question. So, Elaine, if you want um, a copy of the book, just I'm going to send, I'm going to put the our email address in the chat and you can just send me an email with your information and I'll, I'll send it out to you. Um, what else builds or something I missed? Are we done? <laughs> Uh, so much fun getting to like, I love doing these. Um, we do a book launch for an online book launch for all of our books. Um, and they all are on our YouTube channel. Um, so if you go to YouTube and just put an in interstellar fly press, you can find some of the ones that we've done in the past and, um, they're always fun. I really love doing them. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I'm sure that most of you have it, but if you don't, make sure you grab a copy of The Long Follow-Up um, and read all the stories and share them. And it really helps if you leave us a review on Amazon. Um, I know that that gets harped on a lot, but it really, really does help. Um, and we love, you know, hearing from readers and um, we love that you guys came out. So I really appreciate it. And yeah, thank you, Bill, for writing so many great stories. Well, believe me, uh, I love to I love to write short fiction. So even though I've been writing a lot of novels lately, short fiction is my first love still. So it is. I yeah. love it too. I think it's it's. I love that we get to do short fiction collections. You know, there's not a lot of places publishing them, um, and we have some really awesome ones coming out um, of the call that you were a part of and um, and you know we're always we're always interested in projects so I always say if you if you have something that might fit us feel free to pitch us um, but we, I love short story collections so yeah yeah John I will be at FinCon so mm -hmm. that's the plan <laughs> sounds good all right, y'all. Well, I think that's it. We'll all go uh, have dinner now. But <laughs> thanks. thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks for coming, everybody. This, yes. was a, this was a lot of fun.